within a population, which is di very different from the evolution of new species or the evolution of new groups. So we're going to talk about some mechanisms for those. So when you look at microevolution, one thing that can cause um, a change it would be mutation. So are mutations random or non-random? Random, right? So if we get a new allele popping up in the population, this could change the allele frequency. So mutations are one mechanism of microevolution. Another mechanism would be natural selection. So what was the video that we watched um, last Monday, our Monday, that talked about natural selection? What was the example? The mice. The mice. So the rock pocket mice. So populations of rock pocket mice that are found on lava flows have changed over time due to the fact that dark mice are more likely to survive and to reproduce. And so natural selection is non-random, okay? So mutations are random. Natural selection is non-random. And then I gave a subset of natural selection, which is sexual selection. So we talked about traits like weaponry or like bright colorations or even behavioral traits like males um, have behaviors during the breeding season that make, make it less more likely that they will be uh, preyed upon by predators. But it also increases the likelihood of passing their genes on to the next generation. Then we looked at genetic drift. So is genetic drift random or non-random? It is random. So you want to think about the difference between drift and selection. So this is random. So what was the example that we had in lab this week? What was the, where we checked, uh, uh, well, the nene would be an example. Yes, the nene was an example. And that was an example of what mechanism? The bottleneck effect. So when you did that simulation where you took that population from 50 individuals down to 10 individuals, what you found is, is that the allele frequency changed. And some of you had graphs that kind of went up and down, and you did lose the genetic variation. Some of you lost the red allele. Some of you lost the black allele, right? So that's the idea of drift. So they just kind of drift right they can change just due to these random changes and it's not towards a particular characteristic so it's not like directional selection it's not like disruptive selection and it's not like stabilizing selection it is just random changes okay, so that's genetic drift now the other um, example that we have not talked about yet about genetic drift is what is called founders effect And we can see this in human populations a lot because what we see is, is that there have been migrations of humans where a few individuals have given rise to a larger population. So like they might go to a new land and they form a population and there might be like 100 people. And those 100 people that came from the other country have a particular allele frequency that is probably different from the larger sample of the entire country. And so sometimes we get populations that have unique traits based upon the uh, founder's effect. So there's a good example of this and in humans, and it's called the, um, uh, the people where we find it is called the Pennsylvania, you know, I don't know, Sylvania <laughs> Dutch. Right? Pennsylvania Dutch. And these, um, ten, these are actually an Amish people. And this Amish population brought with them when they founded the population certain characteristics. And now it's more likely because they tend to um, like to marry and to have children within their religion and in their culture. 
And so one thing that they have is what is called polydactyly. So what do you think polydactyly is? Many fingers. And so they might have an extra finger or an extra toe. So polydactyly is an example of a trait that is much higher in the Amish population that was founded um, than it is in the rest of the um, country. Another example of a trait that they have, which is much higher, is what is called dwarfism. So a form of dwarfism, there are many different genetic causes for dwarfism, but a form of dwarfism is more com common within this population because of the people that founded it. So if we look at um, an image, skip through here, sorry. Bottleneck effect. Okay. So this would be an example. This child has um, dwarfism, and then they, they also have the extra fingers and toes. And so that would be um, an example of a mechanism of microevolution. So within the human population, we get variation in um, particular traits. And so this is not from your book, but I think that it, this one is fascinating because it shows the founder's effect of different places on the planet. Um, and so when we think about the first people, first people that went to Costa Rica, um, then 4,000 uh, people um, were the founding population and the number of generations was 12, right? And then there's 2.5 million people today. Finland, and maybe this, you know, I have the, um, I'm not sure if this is the number of indigenous people or the people that colonized the land, right? So Japanese, maybe a thousand individual, um, fin Finnish, the Finnish population, 500. And so it's kind of interesting to see how small the founding population was that then gave rise to this a larger population. Now, founding populations are the whole story because we have another mechanism of microevolution, which is called, oops, not run non-random mating, gene flow. Okay. Ah, gene flow. Okay, so this is another mechanism. So you can write this down under mechanisms of microevolution. So gene flow is we, where we get the migration of individuals from one population to another. So those individuals will bring new variation into the population and they can dramatically alter in some cases the um, allele frequency in that population. So we have people today in the United States that are have that sickle cell allele, right? And they um, have it and they're in the United States and they brought it into the population so that the original indigenous people here did not have that sickle cell allele, but the people today do. And then if there's any um, people of Northern European descent that have a sickle cell allele, they must have had an ancestor that was um, bred into their lineage, right, that carried that new allele into their family. So gene flow is a big, quite a big deal. And it's actually really good to have gene flow because it um, increases genetic variation, right? So this causes an increase in genetic variation. So if we're talking about conservation biology, we would say that we want to ensure that gene flow does happen between populations. And so some of the problems that we have now is, is that migration routes of organisms have been cut off, like perhaps by roads or fences, highways going through a desert, for example, could um, isolate um, one population from another, or a big wall would isolate one population from another, and we wouldn't get gene flow. And so we would, what we would predict is, is that those populations wouldn't have as much genetic variation. And sometimes, you know, we spend a great deal of money sometimes taking animals from one population to another. So we might take bison from North Dakota and ship them to, um, um, Montana in order to make sure that the population in Montana maintains its genetic diversity and its variation. 
So sometimes we end up um, transporting animals from one place to another to simulate gene flow. So this is just an example of how you might have gene flow between two populations. So we have the western deer population and the eastern deer population. And you can imagine that the Rocky Mountains, which divide our continent into two parts, two drainages, so that the rivers flow towards the um, Pacific on one side and towards the Atlantic on the other side, that that would be a great barrier, right? And so those two populations are isolated, but under certain, in certain places you might find um, migration routes which would carry one individual um, across and or maybe a couple of them into a new population. Okay. So genetic variation in gene flow is good. Okay, so the other thing I wanted to talk about, I need to back up a little bit, is non-random mating. So sexual selection is a form of non-random mating. But sometimes we see um, non-random mating it not causing um, particular characteristics, but be, being due to particular um, in, incidences or, or um, environments in which some males are more likely to mate than others. And so kind of the famous example of this in humans is a really interesting one, and it includes the Hopi Indians. So the Hopi Indians have, uh, it was noticed that they had a higher than average incidence of albinism. So they have a high rate of albinism. And so um, early on people went in there and they tried to determine why they had a higher rate of albinism than other indigenous populations. And what they discovered is it had to do with their culture. So um, in particular, males were usually the hunters, but males with albinism um, stayed at camp with females rather than going on extended hunting trips. So those males that had albinism and stayed out of the sun and stayed with the females and did the female work actually had a, had an uh, increased likelihood of bearing children, right? So they were the ones that were the fathering the children. And so that increased the rate of albinism within the Hopi populations. Obviously, that would be a bad thing if it got too high, if the rate of albinism got too high, because these guys live in arid, sunny Arizona-like environments, right? So that would increase the likelihood of getting skin cancer and dying, right? So albinism does have some detrimental effects because you're more likely to um, get skin cancer and die of it because you don't have the pigment protecting you from the UV radiation. So you have a higher rate of mutation. Now there's another one that's really in interesting um, that they've just recently discovered by looking at the Y chromosome of males. So looking at the Y chromosome of males, remember that the X and the Y do not cross over. They're not homologous. So like if you were a male and you went onto that 23andMe um, site and you ordered your kit, you would come back with analysis of your Y chromosome and it would tell you what group of males you shared a Y chromosome with. Similarly, if you're female, they would do that with the mitochondrial DNA because we inherit mitochondrial DNA from our mother. But if you're a male, the Y chromosome is really interesting. And so they, they have discovered that there was one male in history that seemed to be very prolific at fathering people and has a lot of um, ancestors today. So this is Genghis Khan, who was around in the Middle Ages. And he wasn't a very nice person in terms of a leader because he was a warrior. And he also had um, tended to, once he conquered a land, he tended to mate with the females in that population. And so when they look and they try to figure out how many males today share the Y chromosome that was passed down by Genghis Khan, 
um, we see that a lot of children, or a lot of males, do I have that? Oh, I don't have the, I think it was like, oh, quarter of a, I might have to look it up. Um, okay, sorry, let me look that up. We'll just Google that, because I can't remember the exact number of males today, alive today. Ingus. Um, offspring. Okay, so this is the data. Okay, so one out of 200 men alive today, gosh, I can't even do the math on that since what, what is there? There's probably half of, half of the individuals so that would be like three and a half billion. So um, whatever that proportion is, so it's millions probably of men um, have that particular Y chromosome. So that would be a really good example of non-random mating. And unfortunately, the, it was it's very common and even is common today that when people conquer um, and other people, they mate with the females in that population to try to um, get their genes into the gene pool. Okay. okay. We also have just non-random random mating within populations, say, for example, based upon religion. So generally, people tend to marry within the same religions and have the same cultures. You might also be more likely to mate with somebody who is in your hometown than mating with somebody who lives across the country. And so non-random mating can affect um, population genetics in that way as well. Okay, so the last thing we're gonna to talk to, about today is speciation. And so we're gonna define what a biological species is. So a biological species is a group of individuals that can potentially mate and produce viable fertile offspring. And the reason why fertility is important is sometimes you can get a hybrid between two species that is not fertile. So for example, a donkey and a horse produces what? A mule. And mules are almost always sterile, so mostly sterile, right? So we don't um, find mules being able to mate with other mules and producing baby mules, right? So they're mostly sterile. So we say that donkeys and horses are of a different species. So they are not of the same species because the offspring that they produce are not fertile. So potentially it could be that you could put them together and if you put them together, and like in a captive breeding program and they were able to mate and produce viable fertile offspring, then we could kind of define that as being the same species. And this is really important from a, a conservation biology perspective because in order to conserve something, it's gotta be a species, right? So subspecies are, so when we talk about the subspecies, these are populations of the same species okay, that are generally geographically isolated. 
So the spotted owl, for example, the northern spotted owl and the, and the other sub, sub, subspecies, all those would um, not be considered separate species because they're subspecies, and so they're not protected under the Endangered Species Act. So it's really important um, to when you when you figure out what a species is to kind of fight for that, because then you can um, formulate some kind of protection for them. So subspecies are not as um, as protected as the species are. Okay. So when we talk about speciation, what this means is, is that what makes them not able to reproduce? So what is it that would make two individuals unable to reproduce? And so we have mechanisms that cause this inability to reproduce. And so we can talk about reproductive isolating mechanisms. So we can talk about what are called prezygotic mechanisms. So what this means is this would be for, would be before even a zygote would be formed. So it's not after a zygote forms, but it's before a zygote forms. And most of the mechanisms are prezygotic. Okay. So we could talk about um, uh, they could be isolated geo geographically, so geography, right? So maybe they're isolated from uh, interbreeding by a mountain range, right? We could also be isolated behaviorally. And the, this is really big for organisms that have very specific courtship. So we have species-specific courtship. Right? So bird song. So like the western meadowlark and the eastern meadowlark don't generally mate with one another, even in places where they live, they cohabitate because they have different songs, right? So this would be like different bird songs. So the male has to sing exactly the right song in order to get close enough to the female to um, mate with her. And so that would be a good behavioral prezygotic mechanism. We also have temporal. So temporal means what? Time, right? So this would be like when they mate. So when is it that they, does that specific species mate? Do that species of frog mate in the early spring or do they mate in the late spring? Do that specific um, species of cricket, do they mate in the morning? Do they, are, the, are they the crickets that call in the morning or are they the crickets that call at night? So generally in some places there are two different groups, two different species of crickets. Crickets that call at night to find a bait and speak, and crickets that call during the morning. Okay, so it could be um, season, right? It could also be um, day versus night. Okay, season, spring versus summer, or late spring, early summer versus late summer, right? So if they're not coming into reproductive potential at the same time, they will be reproductively isolated from each other. Okay. So that is temporal. Okay. We also have mechanical. So this would be, for example, like the male's penis not able to fit into the vagina of a female of a different species. And this is actually quite a big deal in insects. So in insects, like for example, dragonflies or damselflies, um, the male has a very uniquely structured penis and it fits like a key into the lock of the female's reproductive tract. And if they're of the wrong species, they might try to mate, but it doesn't work, right? So the key, which is the penis, right, does not fit 
into the lock, which is the female reproductive tract. So they call this they call this lock and key mechanism of reproductive isolation, and it is an example of mechanical isolation. We can also talk about gametic isolation. So if you think about aquatic organisms like fish, and if you think about the ocean, they generally just release their egg and sperm into the water. And so you can imagine like in a coral reef, you are swimming in egg and sperm, right? There's all kinds of egg and sperm just floating around in the water. So how do those know which is which, right? And so this would be an example where the egg has species specific receptors. The egg has species specific receptors that bind male sperm and allow fertilization. If you think about coral, you know, all these different coral species releasing their egg and sperm in the water, it only comes together if they're of the right species. Right? So they're immediately isolated. Okay. And then we're going to have another group, and this is post zygotic. So this is after the zygote has um, formed. Okay. So you could have zygotes in viability okay so the zygote does not form an embryo so even if the sperm was able to get inside the egg the zygote would, would die right and then you could also have it later on but generally it dies really early when it starts to divide it realizes it doesn't have the right number of chromosomes and so it doesn't survive and then the example of um, the um, offspring in viability, right? So offspring in viability, this is where the offspring die. Probably, this is probably really rare because by the time you've, you've expended a lot of energy to produce an offspring and then it dies, that would be, um, Bad. And then we have hybrid sterility. And so that is the mule example. There are other examples of that, but that's the best example. Yes. Yes. So it could be after they, before they're actually born, if we're talking about mammals. So these are things that keep populations apart and keep species from reproducing with one another. Now we are trying to um, create hybrids unnaturally in order to preserve species. So for example, you might have heard of the Grolar, or sometimes they call it the Pixlr, is that right? No. Pixley Pix Pizzler? No, I'll just put Growler. I can't remember what the other word for it they use. So what do you think the Growler is a a hybrid? Grizzly bear. bear and a polar bear. Right? Those are two separate species. They normally do not reproduce. And so they are starting to reproduce, but their um, offspring are not very viable. So it's believed that their offspring are not as viable as they are separate. So um, the offspring will tend to die without reproducing. So I guess that would be a good uh, example of offspring inviability, is that these tend to not survive as well as the grizzly bear and the polar bear. And then they created some like uh, tigers and lions 
hybrids, fibers. So that's very controversial because they're worried that, um, <clears throat> well, they're worried about that that's probably not the best way to go about conserving genetic diversity within an individual species is by hybridizing them. Might lead to eventually lead to their extinction. Okay, any questions about those mechanisms? So this leads us to, once we have a mechanism in place, this can lead us to speciation. So we can go from one species and get two species. So there are two different mechanisms. One is called sympatric speciation. And sympatric speciation occurs in populations that exist together so that they could potentially interbreed, but they don't. So um, populations that are sim, like symbiotic, so occurs in populations, we'll say, that are not geographically isolated. So some of the famous examples would include the um, Hawaiian oops, honey creepers, creepers in Hawaii, Hawaiian honey creepers. And so these um, eat nectar. And so they have very specific beaks that allow them to eat. And the populations are believed to have evolved while they were together, so they weren't separate, but for some reason, they started to diverge in their structure, possibly because as they got a mutation that helped them feed on a particular flower, that mutation was passed to the next generation. And so this specifically has to do with variation in, beak, in beaks that allow them to feed on different food sources. Okay. And I think I have an example of an image that for the lion honey creepers. Yes. So this starting out as a founding population and then diverging into these different groups, would that be an example of divergent evolution or convergent evolution? Divergent, right? Because they had a common ancestor and then they diverged in structure. If you found a, another bird like this in a completely different part of the planet, so let's say we found this in um, Indonesia, then the similarities in their beaks would be due to similar diets, which would be an example of convergent evolution. So if they didn't have a common ancestor and they had a similar beak, it would be an example of convergence. So you should know the difference between convergence and divergent evolution. Okay, so that's sympatric speciation. Another example of speciation is called allopatric speciation. And this is where the populations are geographically isolated. And this is probably more common. Because once you isolate a population, then it could just randomly, due to genetic drift, change enough that it would be a separate species. So it doesn't require strong selection for a particular trait. Okay, so this is, uh, they believe allopatric speciation is much more common than sympatric speciation. So in allopatric speciation, um, a good example of this would be in the spotted owls. 
So if we look at the northern spotted owl compared to the Mexican spotted owl, these are geographically isolated. Right? And so these are two different species. So even if you brought them together, their offspring would not be viable. So they or they wouldn't even produce offspring because they have different mating. And so this would be an example of isolation that then subsequently leads to speciation. And notice that there's different groups of isolated populations of the Mexican spotted owl. And these might actually turn into subspecies. And then eventually they might actually diverge enough that they would be considered different species. Okay. So we're gonna watch a little video today and it is going to be on the evolution of um, corn. And so when we look at corn today, we realize that the corn that we have today is very different than the ancestral corn. So this is just shows how we can get dramatic changes through a mechanism called artificial selection, which we talked about when we were talking about Darwin. Artificial selection selects for particular traits that have particular characteristics. And so this would be an example of macroevolution because the corn is so dramatically different that it would be considered a different species or breed than the original ancestral corn. And the ancestral corn has a name. Let me put that name up there actually. The name of the ancestral corn is called Teosinte. I can't write on this. So, Teosinte is ancestral corn. So the question is, how has this um, ancestral corn changed over time? carefully bred these plants for generations to make them bigger, sweeter, more colorful, and it's hard to find a plant that we've transformed more completely from this one, maize. Here in the U.S., most of us call it corn, and we eat a lot of it. There's corn bread, corn chips, corn cereal. If you look a little deeper, you'll find corn starch and corn syrup in hundreds of products, and a lot of the meat we eat comes from animals fed a corn-based diet. So maize is all around us, but for a long time, the origin of maize was a mystery. The ancestors of wheat pretty much look like wheat. The precursors of apples basically look like apples, but there's nothing in nature today that looks like this. This is the story of an unexpected collaboration, the story of geneticists and archaeologists working together to discover where maize really came from. Christopher Columbus's crew were the first Europeans to see maize, but by the time Columbus arrived, people all over the Americas had been growing maize for thousands of years. Archaeological evidence from around the world reveals that starting around 10,000 years ago, humans were beginning to live in larger settlements and to manipulate wild plant and animal species to better suit their needs. In the case of plants, this process of domestication led to plants that we call crops, like wheat, apples, and potatoes. And in most cases, the wild relatives of these crops can still be found in nature but you can't find anything that looks like maize growing in the wild today. And even the earliest fossil years of maize, which are more than 6,000 years old, already look essentially like today's crop. So where did maize come from? 
Many scientists thought that the ancestor of maize must be extinct. But a brilliant young geneticist discovered something that made him think that the ancestor of maize was right in front of us. His name was George Beetle. Beetle was studying a grass from Central America called Teosinte. He found that Teosinte's chromosomes looked nearly identical to those of maize. He also showed that Teosinte and maize could produce fertile hybrid offspring, meaning that they must be closely related. Beetle concluded that Teosinte was likely the ancestor of maize. But many botanists doubted the young scientist's claims. Maize expert Dr. John Doblin at the University of Wisconsin told me why. So, you know, the reason I wanted to bring it out here is to show you just how different part of Teosinte are. Yeah. This is a Teosinte plant, and it doesn't look anything like a typical corn plant. No. You can start by just looking down at the base, it just branches a lot, so it is a very bushy creature, and quite different from a corn plant, such as you see here, yeah. where there's just single main stalk. No branches, just except for these two short branches, each of which has uh, an ear on it. The dramatic difference in branching between teosinte and maize is just the beginning. When you look at an ear of corn, you can see hundreds of kernels exposed on the cob. But teosinte is different. Each ear only has a handful of kernels, each enclosed in a fruit case that's so hard you might crack a tooth if you tried to eat it. It was no wonder that botanists doubted that Teosinte could be the ancestor of maize. Beetle moved on to other questions in genetics, which ultimately earned him the Nobel Prize. But the origin of maize continued to intrigue him. And after his retirement, he returned to that question. To silence the skeptics, Beetle had to show how humans could have transformed this into this. So after his retirement, he launched one of the biggest breeding experiments in history to settle that question once and for all. For Beetle, the key question was how many genes control the differences between maize and teosinte. If that number were small, then it wouldn't have been too hard for early humans to transform teosinte into maize. He began by crossbreeding maize with teosinte. In most plants and animals, individuals inherit two copies of each gene, one from each parent. So the offspring from this first generation cross between teosinte and maize, the F1 generation, would have one copy of each gene from teosinte and one from maize. These F1 plants would then be crossed with one another to produce the F2 generation. This is where things get interesting. If only one gene differs between teosinte and maize, then one in four of the F2 plants should look just like maize, and one in four ought to look like teosinte. If two genes are at work, this number drops to one in 16. For three genes, it's one in 64, and so on. If more than three genes were involved, Beetle was going to need a lot of plants. He decided to grow 50,000 F2 plants for his experiment. And what did he find? About one in 500 plants looked identical to Teosinte, and a similar number looked just like maize. That number suggested that changes in just four or five genes were responsible for all the major differences between the two plants. So George Beetle was right. The real ancestor of maize was Teosinte, and it was right in front of us all along. Many varieties of Teosinte grow throughout Mexico and Central America, and humans have lived there for thousands of years. So where and when did they first transform Teosinte into maize? Dobley's team set out to find the answer. They collected DNA samples from different Teosinte varieties throughout Mexico to compare their DNA sequences to those of modern maize. The more closely related two groups of organisms are, the more similar their DNA sequences will be. Dobley's team looks for the teosinte variety with DNA sequences most similar to maize. 
we've actually figured out that all of modern corn traces back to one type of teosinte in the southwestern part of Mexico, near a river called the Balsas River. The relatively small number of DNA sequence differences between maize and the Balsas River teosinte yielded another critical piece of information. We can take teosinte in corn and ask how many mutations do they differ by, and then knowing the rate at which mutations occur, make a prediction about how long ago their paths separated. The more differences in the DNA of two groups of organisms, the longer it's been since their ancestors were all one species. Our estimate is that the original domestication of corn would have taken place sometime around 9,000 years ago. <laughs> Based on genetics, Dobley's team had come up with a hypothesis about where and when maize was domesticated. But the ultimate test would require independent evidence from outside the field of genetics. I visited Dr. Dolores Paperna at the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute in Panama to see that evidence. What did you think when this geneticist from Wisconsin analyzing DNA said, here's where we need to look for the earliest evidence of maize domestication? Teosinte is distributed all over Mexico, highlands, lowlands, it gets down into Nicaragua. So the question for archaeologists was, where did we go? And Dr. Dobley's work told us exactly where to go. 9,000 years ago, people living in this area were taking shelter and preparing food in caves and rock shelters. When we went to the Central Balsas Valley, one of the things we did was to ask local people, do you know of any caves or rock shelters? And that's how we found the Shumatoshi shelter. So people took shelter there, they slept there, they, they probably ate there. They ate there, they cooked their food there. But finding evidence of ancient maize wouldn't be easy. In the tropical environment of ancient Mexico, the cobs and kernels would typically be scavenged or decomposed. But Dr. Paperno wasn't looking for such obvious evidence. These were the earliest plant processing tools. We call them plant grinding stones, so that's what they were used for, and these are no more than river cobbles. Dr. Paperno showed me how ancient people used these stone tools to grind up maize and other crops. In the process, tiny plant pieces might be deposited on the tool's surface, leaving behind microfossils. So we found hundreds of these microfossils right on the grind surface of the stone. And like the seeds, they're very highly diagnostic. So even with these microscopic traces, you can tell the difference between corn and teosinte. Yes, we can tell the difference. Finding maize microfossils on the grinding tools meant that the humans living in the Shiwatoxla shelter were processing maize for food. But how long ago? Archaeologists can calculate the age of ancient remains using radiocarbon dating, but microfossils are too small to date using this method. So Dr. Paperno used charcoal found in the same sediment layer as the grinding stones to determine the age of the microfossils. And so what was the oldest date of these maize remains? They, it's, it's very interesting how well the genetic and archaeological data fit together. The oldest charcoal date we received back was about 8,700 years ago. That date coincided almost perfectly with the date Dr. Dobley predicted from the genetic evidence. So nearly 9,000 years ago, humans had already produced an early version of maize. But how was Teosinte transformed into maize? Back in Dr. Dobley's lab in Wisconsin, I learned about the genetic changes involved. One of the main differences between teosinte and maize is that the teosinte seeds are encased in this, this really hard root case that makes it really difficult to eat. So clearly that's something that had to change 
That's right. And the remarkable thing is that having a food case versus not having a food case is basically controlled by a single gene. Single gene? A single gene. To test this gene's function, Dr. Dobley's team did a clever experiment. They carefully crossbred maize and teosinte to introduce the maize version of the fruitcase gene into teosinte plants. When they did that, the teosinte kernels, which are normally enclosed in a hard fruitcase, became partially exposed, almost like little corn kernels. When they did the opposite, putting the teosinte fruitcase gene into maize plants, the fruitcase became larger and started to cover up the maize kernels, similar to teosinte. One gene makes a pretty dramatic change. So another really obvious difference between teosinte and corn is that teosinte produces dozens of these little tiny ears on a plant that branches a lot. Uh, and corn just produces a couple of ears on a plant that hardly branches at all. So what's going on there? There is one gene that we've identified that plays a central role in that process, and we call it the branching gene. Dr. Dobley explained how putting the teosinte version of the branching gene into maize made the maize plants more branched, like teosinte. And putting the maize version of the gene into teosinte made the teosinte plants <coughs> less branched. Dr. Dobley has shown that the fruitcase gene, the branching gene, and just a few others a small number of genes, just as George Beadle predicted, were responsible for setting in motion all the major differences between maize and teosinte. But how could so few genes cause such huge changes? Why were these genes so powerful? They both belong to a, a special class of genes called regulatory genes, and these are genes that directly regulate the activities of other genes. And so when we move the teosinte version of one of these genes into a corn plant or vice versa, we're actually changing more than just that one gene. That's right, they can turn other genes on and off. You can think of these genes as something like uh, the conductor of an orchestra. And if you would take the conductor from one orchestra and give that orchestra, say, a new conductor, just like we did moving some genes from teosinte maize or vice versa, and you can get a very different quality of music, even though all of the musicians and all the instruments remain the same. These regulatory genes probably influence the activity of hundreds of other genes, which explains how mutations in just a few regulatory genes could dramatically transform teosinte. But there was still one thing I couldn't figure out. So, I understand now how teosinte was transformed into maize, but the thing that's still bothering me is that teosinte really doesn't seem like a very good crop. So, why would anybody have started growing it in the first place? Well, George Beale actually had an idea about that question, and his idea was that they might have used it like popcorn. Huh? And Beale did an experiment to test his hypothesis that they used it like popcorn, and we can do that same experiment here today. All right, let's do it. Remember, the nutritious kernels of teosinte are trapped inside hard fruit cases. But if they popped, like maize kernels, that could be one way the earliest farmers could have eaten teosinte. In Dr. Dobley's lab, we were about to find out whether the ancestor of maize could pop. Okay, so we actually, we've got some pop teosinte here, and uh, the, I should give this a try. It's good to me. That's basically just like pop, tastes like popcorn. The archaeological and genetic evidence tell us a remarkable story. About 9,000 years ago, people living in the Balsas River region of Mexico began growing an unassuming grass called teosinte and ended up transforming it into the amazing crop we now call maize. <laughs> Turn the lights back on. <clears throat>
So would you say that teosinte and maize or the modern corn, are they different species? No, right, because they interbreed and then they can do that cross where they do the hybrids, the F2, so that they would be the same species, even though they look dramatically different. Because even their offspring are can reproduce. Yes, so even their offspring can reproduce. So when we look at this, we can see that the, we have phenotypic differences. So the phenotypic differences were what? In the teosinte. The branching. The branching. the seed casing, and that the uh, fruit was small, right? The seeds are small. Okay. So this is a really good example of artificial selection because it's believed that by selectively breeding those plants that produced better seeds for eating, humans were able to change the population of corn so that we can we now see that it you know produces lots of um, seeds that are good to eat and that are important sources of food. So that's an example of artificial selection. Any questions about that? Okay, so that's it for this quarter. So um, Hopefully everybody gave me your lab notebooks. If you haven't given me your lab notebook, you need to give me your lab notebook. You can, if you don't have it today, you can put it downstairs outside of my office. It's a little wire basket that says Files 101 notebooks, and so they can go there. And I will give you back your notebook. Um, I actually, I'll have them back and outside on a cart on Monday. Um, so you can pick them up on Monday when I come in. I come in about 10. Um, if you want to pick them up before the midterm on Wednesday. So does everybody have a review sheet for the midterm? Yes. Okay, so there is no regular class next week. So the next time I will see you is on Wednesday. Um, I'm going to try to do them by the end of the weekend, so probably on Monday. Your final is, ooh, it's on your review sheet. It's at 1 o'clock, 1 to 3, I think it is. It's also on the campus site. Do you have your lab? Did you turn it in already? Okay. Okay, so put it in that wire basket. Okay. Yep. Oh, sorry.